Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another webinar of International Dermatology Education Foundation Educational Series. Tonight, we will discuss the dynamic skin barrier and why formulation matters. And we are very lucky to have as our guest speaker, Dr. Sonia Abdullah. Dr. Abdullah, she is double board certified in cosmetic and medical dermatology, and she practices uh, in her private office on Blur, Toronto. So just for a couple of, uh, couple of things in here, first of all, we'd like to thank to our supporter, Johnson & Johnson, to support series of those educational series that we had. And also a couple of housekeeping before we begin, if you're having any issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select the phone call in the audio pane and dial in information will be available. Also at the end of this webinar, a survey will pop up in your browser and will be emailed to you within one to two days. We would greatly appreciate if you could fill out this very short survey. If you're having technical issues tonight, or if you'd like to submit a question to our faculty, please submit your question in the questions pane on the right-hand side of your screen. Within one, two days of the webinar, you will receive a certificate of attendance that will be emailed to you. So again, if you have any questions, please submit your questions using the questions pane on the right-hand side of your screen and we will get to them at the end of the uh, program and answer to them as soon as, as, as we are available as we can because of the time uh, restrictions, if we have any. So I just wanna go over what's now new in our dermatology education programs, right? We used to do all these in-person live programs, but now as you can see, we are shifting more into virtual. The new normal in dermatology is becoming more and more virtual. And as part of that, I'd like to discuss International Dermatology Education Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization whose principal mission is to raise awareness and improve dermatology care all over the world through education, especially in underserved areas. And we have done several programs in the past live, but presently, uh, virtually both in the US and Canada, as well as in Europe, Asia, and South America. So tonight, as I mentioned earlier, we're very lucky to have Dr. Sonia Abdullah as our guest speaker to discuss dynamic skin barrier and why formulation matters. Thank you, Sonia. Welcome. Take the floor. Thank you so much for that very, very warm welcome. I'm excited to join you from Toronto this evening. So let's get started. So the learning objectives for this program this evening are gonna look at the skin barrier and its dynamic nature. We'll look at some of the research on products, ingredients and technologies that are, are, are really relevant to the function and the, the support of this dynamic uh, entity. And we'll also look at criteria to consider when making skincare recommendations for patients. So we all know about this entity, the skin barrier. So I'll get you to keep that in the back of your minds as you answer the first polling question. So when I, oh, I have just lost my screen here, just a moment. So when looking at factors you consider when making ingredient or product recommendations to, you, to your patients, um, I'd ask you to select one of the following. Do you look for specific ingredients in a product? Um, does the formulation of the entire product matter? Do you reference the clinical research? Um, do you have samples available to provide to your patients? Or do you consider all of the above?
And so looking at these polling questions as they are coming in, And we're seeing that all of the above is really leading, uh, leading the answers from this particular section. Excellent. So when we're looking at this concept of the skin barrier, we're, we really think of it initially as this kind of basic concept of a, of a brick and mortar uh, structure. So the bricks being the, the corneocytes and the mortar being that lipid bilayer. But it's really so much more than that. And it really kind of oversimplifies the true nature of the, the skin barrier and the complexity that uh, lies within it. So the skin barrier is this living entity that is self-renewing, self-repairing, and it has a number of different functions that are in interconnected and, and really, quite frankly, interdependent. And they're largely located at the level of the, the stratum corneum. But when we're looking at these functions beyond that permeability, that moisture barrier that regulates salt and water retention in the skin and that's going to protect you from the, um, the entry of, of kind of uh, deleterious um, exposures and the escape of things like hydration we're looking at the, the other functions of the skin barrier. So things like its antimicrobial function, um, the way that it protects us from other microorganisms um, in its immune response barrier, the way that interacts with the innate and the adaptive immune system, the antioxidant function of the, the um, skin barrier and the way it responds to reactive oxygen species. And lastly, again, you know, we know the role of the skin barrier and the way that it protects us against UV radiation. So what are the things that are going to affect the dynamic skin barrier? In my clinical practice, I think about things like the age of the patient. So we know that young children, babies, um, their skin barrier functions differently than um, a middle-aged person and differently than an older adult. And so that may impact the, the recommendations that I make in terms of skin care. When we're looking at ethnicity, um, it's been well established when we look at histology specimens that there is a difference in structural, um, in the structural nature of the skin between black and Caucasian skin, but also in terms of the function of the skin barrier. We touched on skincare recommendations, but what else is that skincare uh, regimen doing in the background in terms of how that skin barrier functions? And a number of other things, including external aggressors, environmental exposures in terms of climate, history of sun exposure and sun damage, and intraday variation. So when I think about those intraday variations, you know, from a most basic principle, I think about the things that happen from the time I get up in the morning to when I get out of bed, get in the shower, and eventually get to my clinic. My skin has been exposed to so many different things, uh, so many different stressors from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed. And it's that constellation of these external stimuli that really um, are going to impact the way the skin barrier functions. So we know from the most basic principles from a skin hydration perspective, transepidermal water loss does peak overnight when sleeping. That's why the recommendation to use a quote unquote night cream uh, was initially introduced. We also know that having that prolonged contact time for active skincare ingredients while patients are sleeping really does allow um, the, the, uh, an adequate amount of untouched exposure. Things like cleansers are going to impact the skin pH and the skin barrier, and even hormones, for example, stressors that are going to activate cortisol production and that diurnal variation of sebum production will uh, impact skin barrier function throughout the day. So what are these skincare solutions that have been designed to look at the dynamic skin barrier? Let's look at them a little bit more closely. So in my clinical practice, I think it's always important to have a discussion about skincare strategies that are going to be married, the things that go hand in hand. So things that are going to be very, very basic, but very important to, to identify for patients are going to be cleansers. 
So when gentle cleansing approaches are going to be part of a skincare regimen. We know that cleansers can cause damage to permeability, barrier lipids, barrier lipids um, degrading things like ceramides and proteins that are very important to skin barrier function. Alkaline soaps, cleansers are going to increase the skin pH, again, disrupting skin barrier function. These will lead to increases in transepidermal water loss, protease activity, uh, and increase in scale or skin desquamation. All in all, these do contribute to inflammation and oxidative stress that um, can also further perpetuate the permeability barrier dysfunction. Cleansers have been around for a very long time. We're in a day and age of DIY, right? So 3000 BCE was when we had the first introduction of DIY cleansers. Um, with DIY soaps, um, we are going to evolve much further beyond that to the industrial soaps that were introduced in the late 1800s. Some of my patients continue to come in and are very proud to tell me that they continue to use glycerin soap. And they're almost disappointed when I tell them that we've had so many evolutions since then that they've been behind the times. And so since then, we've had development of things like Sindet bars, um, biodegradable liquids, conditioning cleansers. And now that brings us to today where we have HMP polymers. And so I'll get you to keep that term in the back of your mind as we move on to these next slides. So surfactant-based cleansers are kind of the classic cleansers that are out there. They contain surfactant monomers and micelles, so a hydrophilic and a hybrid hydrophobic component. They act as like little Pac-Man as they come across the surface of the skin. But as they are cleansing the skin, they're also removing skin barrier components, things like lipids, uh, NMF, ceramides, and activating proteases. And these cleansers will penetrate into the skin, so into the skin barrier between the corneocytes at uh, the level of the stratum corneum, and they can stay within the skin, altering skin structure, skin barrier function, uh, impairing the skin barrier, leading to inflammation, stress, and increased cell signaling. How does that translate clinically? Well, patients pre present with things like cirrhosis, pruritus, erythema, they're uncomfortable, and they, they may describe it as that tight feeling, their skin just isn't comfortable. So, you know, this is where we're seeing that clinical correlate in terms of surfactant-based cleansers and the role they play clinically for our patients. So let's go back to that concept of HMP. So hydrophobically modified polymer cleansing technology. And this is a cleansing technology that's meant to effectively cleanse the skin, but minimize skin barrier disruption. So HMP cleansers minimize surfactant penetration, reduce transepidermal water loss relative to controls, but actually do give patients that clean feeling. When we're looking at things like patient feedback in terms of HMP cleansing experience, um, and the feedback from patients with sensitive skin is very positive. So this was a consumer study looking at the cleanser with HMP technology as compared to a benchmark gentle cleanser. It's a study that included healthy women between the ages of 25 and 54 with sensitive skin conditions, atopic dermatitis, acne, rosacea. And when asked uh, for feedback on elements like cleanser residue, was it able to remove your makeup, did it leave the skin feeling smooth, clean, um, and how did your feel, skin feel afterwards, did it feel dry or not, uh, the feedback overall was very positive. And so this cleanser is the Neutrogena Ultra Gentle Daily Cleanser. And what I highlighted earlier was just one of the many studies that have been, been done to include over 800 patients uh, evaluating the HMP cleanser uh, technology. So again, a cleanser that does cleanse the skin, removing dirt, oil, makeup, but does leave the skin feeling soft, smooth, uh, and intact. So again, that marriage of products, cleansers, moisturizers, brings us to some important elements to highlight related to emollients and res restoration of skin barrier. Emollients function from two large mechanisms. First, they're going to prevent transepidermal water loss, 
acting as an occlusive barrier between the skin and the air. Secondly, they will act as humectants. So they are drawing hydration from the deeper layers of the skin all the way to the epidermis. So that dual function does allow emollients to um, restore skin barrier function. In addition to the concept of emollients and skin barrier function, there's been a lot of buzz around key ingredients. Ceramides in particular have had a moment, I'd say in the past 10 years when it comes to skin care. But the important thing to understand about ceramides is that it's not enough to have ceramides in your formulation. They actually have to penetrate the skin in order to replenish that skin barrier um, from a structural perspective. And there's some data to show that not all ceramide preparations are created equal, and some topically applied ceramides will actually remain at the surface of the skin and unable to perform their key activity. So when we look at other mechanisms to uh, support skin barrier function from an emollient perspective, there is a liquid crystal gel matrix that has been developed by J&J &J used in the Neutrogena Hydro Boost product. And it has three key elements that lead to its elegance and function. And these are going to be key ingredients like hyaluronic acid, again, an ingredient that has gained popularity in the world of skincare, um, where we really kind of glean its hygroscopic properties, um, you know, drawing in more than a thousand times than its own molecular weight. Glycerin, an ingredient that's been around for a very long time. Again, you'll remember that glycerin soap that we talked about, but this is glycerin being used as a humectant in an emollient um, that does penetrate through nine layers of the skin surface for long lasting hydration. And then lastly, olive oil derived emulsifiers. So olive oil is not always an ingredient that we think of when it comes to skin care, but J&J has taken this particular variant and made it um, suitable for skin care where we're able to really optimize its key function and allow it to, to exist in the form of a liquid crystal that is going to replicate the lipid bilayer um, organization uh, of, the, uh, of the skin barrier. So again, those three components in the liquid crystal gel matrix found in uh, Neutrogena Hydro Boost. So when looking at the gel matrix moisturizer, so how does it perform from a hydration perspective? These are infrared images looking at untreated skin, a benchmark moisturizer and the gel matrix moisturizer in question. And in red, this is um, going to represent the levels of hydration achieved with application of those two moisturizers and an untreated control. So you'll see here the red in the gel matrix moisturizer uh, represents an 86% increase in relative water content uh, compared to the untreated control and 33% better hydration with uh, uh, in comparison to uh, another moisturizer. So going back to this concept of ceramides, if you're not able to uh, apply ceramides effectively and allow them to penetrate, what are things that can be done to induce endogenous ceramide production? And so gel matrix moisturizer does boost endogenous lipids through upregulation of uh, specific ceramide synthesis genes, again, compared to a ceramide containing moisturizer. So in blue, you will see upregulation of your ceramide synthesis genes uh, compared in yellow to the benchmark ceramide containing moisturizer. Similar data seen when looking at keratinocyte differentiating genes. And how does this translate to actual ceramide content? Well, when you're using the gel matrix moisturizer for a period of four weeks, you are able to see a relative increase in mean ceramide content after four weeks of application of the gel matrix moisturizer relative to uh, the benchmark moisturizer. So again, this balance between science therapeutic efficacy and the aesthetic acceptability is really going to um, allow us to have access to a product that can be included in a daily skincare routine from a skin barrier replenishment perspective when including um, an emollient or moisturizer in a skincare routine. 
I'm excited to share this last portion of the presentation with you that is focusing on retinol. So retinol is one of the key ingredients that I think is really important to offer to patients as part of a positive aging skincare routine. Um, but you'll see that as we, as we move on, uh, retinol is more than just uh, anti-aging. So vitamin A in dermatology has been around since the early 1900s. It was first identified in a lab uh, and derm research kind of pittered around it for a number of different years. Because it was highly unstable, dermatologists weren't always interested in using it uh, and really quite frankly, weren't able to use it in, in therapeutics. So it really took the skincare industry, um, their kind of level of innovation, their desire to, uh, to look at a retinol formulation um, that was going to be more stable to lead to the growth of retinol in, in skincare. And in the mid-1990s, Neutrogena was among the first, actually the first, to launch a stabilized retinol product. And so beyond photo aging, I mentioned it earlier, Retinol is used for so many different clinical indications in dermatology, acne, dispigmentation, wound healing, particularly from a systemic perspective, um, rosacea. And do recall, we can use retinol in rosacea. It just needs to be the right formulation. Hyperkeratotic skin disorders, eye disorders, it does play a role uh, in anti-tumor genesis as well as hair growth. So it really does sound like the, the optimal molecule to include in, uh, in dermatology. So when we look at the metabolism of vitamin A, uh, retinol does have a precursor known as retinol palmitate. We will see that in some skincare formulations. That is the most stable uh, form of vitamin A that we do see in skincare. But where we're talking this evening is retinol. And so retinol, in order for it to be metabolized to its active form, which is retinoic acid, it does first have to bypass retinaldehyde, again, active form, retinoic acid. And the reason that retinol is so important and such a key workhorse in dermatology is at its level of gene transcription. So it has, uh, it, it travels to the nucleus where it does um, it change the transcription of genes in a positive manner, resulting in clinical improvement from an anti-aging perspective that I'll touch on in just a moment. So this is a scale, again, showing those retinol derivatives that we see in skincare. So the retinol acid at one end of the, sp the spectrum, the most stable derivative, retinol coming up next, retinaldehyde and retinoic acid, again, the active metabolite. But on the screen, on your right, you'll see retinoic acid. Where we have retinoic acid, we also see increases in potency and increases in irritation potential. So it's finding that fine balance between stability and clinical efficacy and tolerability that are going to allow you to have a, a, a perfect uh, skincare uh, ingredient. So when looking at the mechanism of action from the perspective of retinol, <laughs> retinol functions through upregulation of uh, TGF beta. And with upregulation of TGF beta, we see promotion of elastin and collagen production. We see increased levels of glyc glycosaminoglycans like hyaluronic acid. And so this is an example of where you can use a molecule, again, to stimulate endogenous components of that skin barrier that are going to be key um, from a clinical standpoint. And remember, these are the things that lead to that skin resilience, that, pump, that plumpness that, that patients find desirable. In addition to that, um, retinol does upregulate uh, other uh, growth factors in, involved in dermal cell proliferation and dermal repair. It downregulates keratinization, stimulating cell exfoliation. And one of the things that I think is always interesting is that patients have a, a misconception related to um, the role of retinol and skin thickness. And I'll touch on that in just a moment. Um, the last thing I want to highlight here in terms of mechanisms is that 
retinol down regulates matrix metalloproteases. So those components of the skin that are actually known to degrade um, collagen. So those are down regulated when exposed to retinoic acid. And these are some good examples, again, showing um, retinol compared to vehicle, looking at glycosaminoglycan uh, levels over a period of six months. So this is at baseline and at 24 weeks after exposure, we see upregulation of glycosaminoglycan uh, levels, so relative induction after 24 weeks of daily exposure. And at the right of your screen, we are seeing histologic examples of a baseline vehicle exposed skin versus retinol exposed skin. And that dark violet color um, is representative of the hyaluronic acid content in the skin. So again, when we're looking at cell proliferation in the context of retinol, uh, retinol does upregulate KI67 staining, so that um, cellular turnover. It also upregulates fibroblast, fibroblast upgrowth. When I speak to patients and people have concerns about using retinol, they, in some particularly younger patients, um, they have concerns using retinol because they think it may thin the skin. And it actually does the complete opposite of that. So being able to, to share that type of data, I think it is really important from, um, from our ability to dispel some of these uh, myths that are being perpetuated on platforms like social media. And again, these are again good examples um, that support the, the fact that retinol does stimulate um, collagen tropoelastin synthesis, actually thickening the skin as opposed to, to thinning it. And again, on the right of your screen, um, the, uh, the examples of collagen degradation and how they are down-regulated uh, with MMP1 and MMP9 following retinol use. So it's always this balance between bioactivity, the innovation behind formulations, and clinical efficacy that are going to support the development of a key skincare product. And so the product line that I was referring to was the Neutrogena Rapid Wrinkle Repair line. It's been around for a number of years, um, but continues to be a key, um, a key tool in our toolbox when we're looking for retinol uh, options for skincare in our clinical practice. So what exactly is different with the Rapid Wrinkle Repair line? So this is a study looking at a number of different over-the-counter retinol products and looking at CRAB BP2 expression, so cytosolic retinoic acid binding protein 2. And CRAB BP2 expression is a reflection of retinol bioactivity. So you'll see on the bottom left of your screen in red the peak level of the Neutrogena Rapid Wrinkle Repair product relative to some other prestige brands of retinol, and you'll see the different concentrations, so 0.2%, 1%, um, that uh, are, are also included here, and a number of other mass consumer uh, retinol products. So how does the rapid wrinkle repair line um, have such high activity um, when we're looking at uh, CRAB BP2 levels? And so uh, rapid wrinkle repair um, uses a hydrolyzed Mertis extract uh, in their component. And this particular plant extract derived from the Mertis flower, a Mediterranean shrub, is rich in certain components something called oligogalacturonans. And this is a small length chain uh, sugar that has synergistic effects with retinol boosting its bioactivity. So on the bottom of your screen, you'll see the uh, difference in uh, mRNA, mRNA, so crab B2, pardon me, crab BP2 mRNA levels in a non-treated control standard retinol, and then retinol with Mertis extract. So really reflecting that synergistic effect. 
one of the um, one of the strategies that can be used in uh, retinol from a tolerability perspective is going to be the rate at which the retinol is released into the skin. So the faster the retinol is released into the skin, the higher the likelihood of irritation. And this is showing product A, a retinol that is very rapidly released into the skin that correlates with high levels of skin irritation versus one that is going to be of more slow release formulation and leads to better tolerability. And other things that can be done when we're looking at the diffusion rate of a retinol is looking at the polarity of the molecule. So clinically, patients are always looking for clear outcomes when it comes to integrating an anti-aging or a positive aging skincare ingredient into their routine. And some of the outcomes that were evaluated um, with the Neutrogena Rapid Wrinkle Repair Night product um, are going to be things like fine lines, crow's feet, coarse lines under the eyes and sallowness, so marker of uh, complexion clarity. And these were the results of a double blind eight week study, including 40 women between the ages of 40 and 69 using this specific moisturizer, retinol containing moisturizer on a nightly basis for photo aging. And so you'll not only see that outcomes such as crow's feet and sallowness, moderate improvement in a short period of time, so at four weeks um, and eight weeks, we are seeing that improvement, but also with um, outcomes such as, um, such as coarse lines under the eye and fine lines. So one of the things that I think is important to take away is that mean improvement, about 20% at one week, you know, that is early improvement, but sticking with a product for a longer period of time is going to yield further change. And again, many of our patients are looking for rapid uh, improvement. And so giving them that support and encouragement to continue and sticking with a specific product for a prolonged period of time is that, uh, that much more important. So in addition to um, wrinkle outcomes, so righted outcomes, things like forehead wrinkles, under eyes, crows, um, and cheek wrinkles, uh, we're also looking at markers for pigmentation. So uh, complexion clarity that can be achieved with retinol use. And again, this is the long game. So this is a study looking at the 52 week outcomes of uh, retinol in red versus vehicle. So seeing very positive responses after one year of use from, from a complexion based outcome. So improvement in model pigmentation, 84% uh, improvement uh, relative to, to, to baseline. And again, significant improvement um, with over 50% of patients showing more than two grade improvement in, uh, in wrinkle parameters. So again, not just from a line and a wrinkle perspective, but also from a complexion-based perspective and again, supporting the use over time. Beyond retinol and hyperpigmentation um, in, in our kind of anti-aging population, we're, we're looking at acne being a top concern for patients with skin of color. And we know that acne is inflammatory um, and it can lead to post-inflammatory uh, hyperpigmentation or what's known as macular hyperpigmentation of acne and, and as well as hypertrophic scarring. When patients with skin of color um, were, were questioned, you know, more than 50% of patients with Hispanic skin identified this hyperpigmentation as being a concern to them. More than 65% of black patients and close to 50% of patients of Asian background. So, you know, it is really something that is a significant, not just the acne, not just the scarring itself, but this intense um, macular hyperpigmentation of acne that is important to recognize. So I'm happy to share with you that there are alternatives for patients and you know everybody loves a system, right? Something that they can use in the morning, something that they can use at bedtime. Um, and so this is an acne system for patients both to address acne and post acne uh, hyperpigmentation. 
to step one being a morning formulation of 2.5% micronized benzoyl peroxide to treat the acne, and step two, its counterpart, a retinol formulation to help reduce uh, macular hyperpigmentation of acne at that time. So again, an option for our patients um, that goes beyond the, the kind of standard uh, algorithm that we have access to. In addition to having a very clear system of what to use when, uh, we always want to know that patients are going to be satisfied um, with these clinical outcomes. So this was a patient feedback study looking at acne breakout improvement and uh, pigmentary outcomes uh, over a period of 12 weeks. And so on your left, uh, when looking at acne breakout improvement, uh, you'll see that spike between week zero and one, reflecting significant improvement noted by patients early on. Again, that is what patients are looking for. They want to see things better and they want to see them fast. And when looking at um, skin complexion, pigmentation, imperfection improvement over time, again, you're seeing that steady improvement out to 12 weeks um, with very, very high levels of patient satisfaction. So I've covered a whirlwind of topics when it comes to things like skincare, so cleansers, emollients, um, retinols, and, and briefly on acne. So what did you find most compelling regarding the scientific presentation? Was it that overall formulation of a product matters? Uh, was it the dynamic skin barrier this as a concept? Was it the comparative clinical research on retinol and hyaluronic acid or a combination of all of the above? I look forward to hearing what your thoughts were. So again, a resounding all of the above with close to 90% uh, and, and definitely some signal for the value, again, of emphasizing the, the role of the dynamic skin barrier and, uh, and retinol and hyaluronic acid in, uh, in our portfolio. So we've covered a number of different topics tonight. And again, I think one of the key takeaways is that concept of the skin barrier being a dynamic structure that's going to perform a number of different functions um, that are highly, um, highly important. Remember the skin is the largest organ of the body and we, we really have to, to respect it. Uh, again, um, this dynamic nature of the skin barrier uh, has, uh, has led to innovation in skincare. Um, that can really give us great options for patients in terms of efficacy uh, and again supporting that experience that that they're looking for from an aesthetic standpoint so when looking at criteria for product recommendations there are a number of things that i always keep in mind and you know some of these are a little bit more basic basic science focused in particular the things like the bioactivity and the stability of the formulation but practical things like cost of the product i think are really really important for our patients the aesthetic acceptability of a product, again, will dictate how that is received by your patients and the shelf availability. When you send somebody to the store to look for a product or if it's something that you're carrying in your practice, is it available to actually share with patients at that time? And lastly, and, and I think this goes back to, to the ethos of everything that we do in dermatology, but it's going to be the safety and efficacy of those products for our patients from a, a clinical standpoint, as well as, um, as tolerability. So this is the final polling question. I'll share it with you now. Moving forward, will you consider the overall formulation of a product when making recommendations to your, uh, to your patients? Please select one of the following. Yes, I did not in the past, but will do so in the future. Yes, I already considered how a product is formulated. No, not in the past, and don't think I will in the future unsure and I would like to learn more. So let's wait and see where we are from that perspective. And 
some great feedback, you know, some who would love to continue to learn more. And I think when it comes to the world of skincare, it's always um, important to have that, uh, that hunger to, to learn more. And I'm happy to see that, you know, the formulation uh, will certainly have an impact uh, on your, your clinical decision making moving, moving forward. Well, Dr. Abdullah, that was one of the most scientific presentations I have ever seen on an over-the-counter product, right? <laughs> when, we, when we present um, medical dermatology and, uh, you know, uh, um, Health Canada approved products, of course, there is so much studies, there's so much science behind it, but for an over-the-counter products and uh, Really, this was so scientific, and I learned a lot all about that retinol and the, especially the surfactants. And we have a lot of questions about the surfactants because people hear at the surfactants, but really not much well known. And uh, I know that they are irritating, right? So tell us a little bit more about the surfactant story. So surfactants were are definitely part of the the cleanser story, and they're part of kind of more ancestral um, skin cleaning products. You know, if you've ever been in the shower, or maybe sometimes, for example, when you're traveling and you're not necessarily going around with your 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 own uh, your own skincare products, you'll feel that kind of like residue that's left on the skin. And so, objectively, from a clinical standpoint, that is surfactant residue, but even at the, the most kind of microscopic level, those surfactants that are left behind, they're essentially a form uh, of cleanser that's left behind in the skin that is just not washed off. And this kind of product or, or, or entity that's left behind is very irritating. And so when we're seeing patients in our clinical practice counseling on skincare, cleansers marry with moisturizers. So they're really important to, to counsel um, as, a, as a two-fold entity. So that brings up the question, you know, not all the products, we have so much, right? When you walk into the uh, Pharma Pre or CVS, Walgreens, you name it, the shelves are full of different products. And sometimes the same ingredients are in different products. So how they are, but we know that they are not created the same. We know that the formulation makes a big difference. It's my line. I always say vehicle matters, right? And um, so how do you suggest what product to pick and, you know, how do you tell your patients how to, how to go about those over-the-counter stuff? So, you know, I think in dermatology, we're really, we're really fortunate. We have a, a good understanding of clinical trials. We can look at data critically and we've seen this evolution in skincare, not only since the pandemic, but, but, but even before then. And there is this desire to get objective data on key uh, skincare formulations. So I think it's up to us to look at the data to help guide patients from a clinical efficacy standpoint, from a tolerability standpoint, um, and, and recognize that there's also a trend right now around consumers and key ingredients. So it's not only, it's not enough to guide people just to say, look for this ingredient, but we may have to go even further to say, look for this ingredient in this formulation. Great. Um, well, another one, uh, it's, it's a really great question. What is a soap-free cleanser and how is it different from surfactant? It's a really good question. You know, when we're looking at soaps, true soaps, um, they are the kind of, uh, you know, micellar based uh, cleansers. Um, and, you know, when we're looking at soap free, we're, we're looking at products that don't contain detergents, right? So they're not going to have those kind of emulsifiers that are going to break down oils, including skin barrier products. Um, so, so that's really the, the kind of greatest difference between non-soap cleansers uh, and surfactant-based uh, soap-free soap cleansers and a, a surfactant-containing uh, product. Great. Now, um, 
why does acne flare up in the first couple of weeks after starting retinol? Uh, that's a great question. Usually it does happen mostly with the retinoids, but it does happen sometimes with retinol too. And then I guess the next logical question will be how do we manage that? So it, it, we don't know 100% why it occurs, and it does happen in about 15% of patients. And we call this retinization. It typically occurs about four to six weeks out following a prescription retinoid use. But again, because we are getting metabolism to retinoic acid, it is possible to occur in the context of, uh, of, of retinol as well. So typically in my clinical practice, I'll usually encourage patients to, to perform what I call a slow start. So easing them into the use of a topical retinol or retinoic acid, um, retinoid, so that they can, one, make sure that they tolerate it. Um, but this, this concept of retinization and purging is very well known to patients. And it is one of the things that is is one of the rate limiting steps to to committing to to using a retinol in um, in their skincare routine so typically slow start so twice weekly uh for a couple of weeks every other night for a couple of weeks and then eventually nightly again always based on tolerability yeah i actually do the same actually even for my acne patients on retinoids right i start Absolutely. slowly and then is it slow i think it really does cut that excessive flare even though it still sometimes happens um well this is just up your alley here it's a cosmetic laser question if i had post facial laser irritation should i still continue with my laser treatment or keep doing it and add a calming cream so it ultimately depends on what the indication for the treatment is and the class of laser. You know, some patients will get um, a, an acne flare post laser, whether it is laser hair removal uh, or resurfacing laser. Um, I think it's an important thing to discuss with um, the clinician that's overseeing your treatment and to describe what exactly is happening from a flare up perspective, because there is supportive skin care that can either be stopped or started um, leading up to your treatment and afterwards. Uh, it does not necessarily mean that you need to abandon your treatment, but it means that some attention needs to be paid in terms of pre and post care. Excellent. Um, another back to formulation. Overall formulation matter, but what is it exactly that ensures the formulation is optimal and eff efficacious? Mm -hmm. You know, I think, again, we're looking at things like key ingredients, key ingredients, depending on what the clinical indication is for the product, um, understanding what the stability of the product is going to be. Um, and, you know, we, we talked about things like vehicle, right? The vehicle really does matter. It is so important. And we know that vehicle has an impact in a lot of therapeutic areas, whether it's acne, rosacea, atopic dermatitis, psoriasis. So, you know, from a clinical standpoint, it's certainly impactful, but from a skincare standpoint as well. And so all of these things are going to, to interplay and, and dictate choice. Yeah, um, this is a good one as a, um, you know, to finish up. You named several factors that can influence the skin barrier, but what are the top three or so I should always be mindful of when making regimen and product recommendations. And so I'll share, you know, in terms of my clinical practice, the things that are going to dictate um, just basic principles like tolerability. I'll always consider the age of the patient. So, you know, a child versus a, a middle-aged adult versus somebody who's more mature. I think that, that plays a big role. Um, climate. So we are heading into colder weather. What time of year? We're in Canada, right? So we know that transition seasons going from summer to fall, some people get flares of certain uh, clinical entities. Seborrheic dermatitis is the one that is everywhere in my practice right now. Um, and then heading into the winter, uh, things like atopic dermatitis. So climate um, and, and external like weather aggressors. And then lastly, I think it's always important for us as dermatologists to ask patients what else they're doing at home. So what other skincare they are using that is going to impact skin barrier function. 
because we are in the world of DIY, whether it's a DIY formulation that people are putting together at home or coming up with their own complicated 12-step routines, because that will dictate the success of what we introduce to patients. So um, this is sort of an interesting concept, right? In dermatology, we almost every inflammatory disease, uh, we recommend some kind of injective treatment, regardless if you're treating acne, psoriasis, rosacea, uh, um, you know, you name it, atopic dermatitis. So do you differentiate your recommendations according to the inflammatory disease? Yes. And, you know, it's a bit of a loaded question because sometimes I find myself really looking for very basic supportive skin care right. and it can be for things like, uh, like acne therapeutics where I know that they are going to just need some more basic things in the background. But then where that tends to shift is when I'm looking to deliver an active ingredient to the skin. So, for example, an OTC acne product. Uh, benzoyl peroxide, salicylic acid. So the, there, there are going to be uh, principles that will differentiate um, from from an active ingredient therapeutic perspective. Right, and I think that brings us maybe this. Uh, this is a sort of a interesting, but really a scientific question. Why is there uh, in atopic dermatitis there is a uh, epidermal barrier dysfunction? versus psoriasis, which both are inflammatory diseases. Now we're getting a little bit more medical dermatology, but I think it might be an interesting question to address since we have it. Yeah, and, and I think we're still learning more. I think we, we still have a lot to learn when it comes to skin barrier function and some of our chronic, chronic inflammatory, inflammatory dermatoses. We also are seeing very strong vehicle responses from our prescription therapeutics as well. So we know that there's a role for, for skin barrier therapy um, even when we're not including a, a prescription active. So chicken, egg, there's just, we need to learn more. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think we are almost there. I really thank you so much for all the uh, answers, but really this was such a well done, scientifically based uh, uh, lecture that I do appreciate it. I also wanna uh, thank again our supporter, Jensen & Jensen, to make this evening possible. And I thank for all your attendees and thank you very much and have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thanks to everyone, good night.